Welcome everybody to the Nature at School series. We're glad to see you today. This afternoon, we're talking about birds of fire, the Kirtland's warbler with Craig Kasmer from Hartwick Pine State Park. Take it away, Craig. Thanks, Natalie. Well, welcome everybody. Um, yes, I'm Craig and I'm here at uh, Hartwick Pine State Park. And today we're gonna talk about the bird of fire, the Kirtland's warbler. Now, keep in mind that the bird does not literally catch on fire. And, and I've done this program several times for different students and they're afraid that the bird catches on fire, but it, we're talking about the trees that are associated with the Kirtland's warbler that like to be on fire. Um, first, let me share with you uh, where I'm at at Hartwick Pines, because this is kind of the range where the Kirtland's warbler is found. And if you've never put in, if you want to put in the chat, if you've been to Hartwick Pines before, um, and we can share stories. Okay, here we go. So there's Howard Pines, Northern Michigan. That yellow push pin indicates where it's basically located. Where if you've ever driven to the Upper Peninsula, um, you've seen the sign, Hot Rock Pine State Park. So you pass right along by it on I-75. It's about an hour and 20 minutes south of the Mackinac Bridge. This is a close-up version of a view of, of Hartwick Pines. It's like a large rectangle. And right there in the center is uh, that yellow, yellow push pin again. That's the visitor center. That's where I work. Now you see a lot of green here and those are trees. This satellite image was taken during the springtime. So a lot of the areas that are not really that green are also forests. They're just deciduous forests or hardwood forests where they have beech, maple, aspen, oak, cherry, things like that. So we at Hardwood Pines are pretty much surrounded by forests. Uh, so I'm very fortunate to be living there. So before we, <coughs> excuse me, get into the bird of fire, let's start out with a very familiar bird to just about everybody. It's our state bird. This is the American Robin. Now, I'm going to play the song for you and put in the chat if you recognize this sound, this bird. Hear it in the spring and summertime. Right, so this bird, as I said, is our state bird, and um, it's a very common sight. Question for you, and put this in the chat. Um, when this bird nests, it, it'll lay its eggs. What color are the eggs? And, uh, maybe you know what they are. Go ahead and put that in the chat, but if you don't, there's a multiple choice. So it's either white or beige or blue or white with beige spots. All right, well, let's see what the answer is here. There it is. Yep, Robin's egg blue. That's even a color swatch you can, you can paint your rooms with. So this bird, you can see where it's laying in uh, its nest inside of a, the, the branches of a tree. It likes to nest above ground. I'll tell you a quick story. So a couple of years ago at my house, I was taking the gutter, the leaves out of the gutters in the fall left the ladder hanging by the shed. I went back next spring to put the ladder away and a robin had come in and made a nest on one of the steps of the ladder. Well, I couldn't take the nest down, so I let it raise its family there. It did two different broods that summer. That next spring or that next fall, I put the ladder away. That bird came back last year, but didn't have a ladder. It came back and nested in a tree really close by. We call that nest fidelity. And so birds, if they have a successful nest, they will come back year after year until it's unsuccessful and then they'll, then they'll try some other place. So this is important to know where the robin lays its uh, eggs and its nest because the Kirtland's warbler is totally different than that. Now, what does this bird eat? Well, this bird eats insects and worms and fruit, things like that. So does this bird stay here all year round? Well, in some cases, it, is it, it does. Here's its range. And you see where Michigan is. Now, I'm here in northern Michigan, as I showed you where Hartwick Pines is. We don't see robins in the wintertime. But I went down a couple weeks ago to visit my mom and my sister down in Rochester, Michigan, in southeast Michigan. And at Christmas time, there were robins there eating the crab apples off my sister's trees. So robins can stay here. 
uh, all year round. And that's where the purple is. And they're found, found west, from the west coast to the east coast, from California all the way up into New Hampshire and Connecticut and parts of Maine as well. The orange indicates where they just breed. That's where they lay their eggs in their nest. Now, if you know anything about Canada, especially way north in Alaska, it gets snowy and cold. Do you think robins can find worms and insects in the snow? It's kind of difficult. So they go down as far south until they find shelter <coughs> and food. Same thing with the, blood, the real light blue way down in Texas and Florida, Mexico. That's where they will go if they don't have suitable habitat where they normally would, would nest. They will go down there and spend the winters. Now, there are other birds that migrate, right? So ducks, like ducks here in northern Michigan, like mallards, they'll be up here until the lakes freeze. And then they go far as far south as they can go until they find open water. They may just go to the county south of me. They may not go all the way down to... Um, to Ohio or Kentucky, they may just go a couple counties away. So now let's talk about the Kirtland's warbler. This is the bird of fire, and I'll explain that in a second. If you look at this bird, it's got a nice, this is the male, a nice yellow um, chest and chin, and then a couple black spots. It's kind of slate gray, but the key identification characteristic here is the broken eye ring. It's broken in the front and broken in the back. Here's its call, and this to me sounds liquidy, if that's a, a word that you can uh, use. And this, this male will sing at the top of a jack pine tree. And we'll talk about jack pine in just a second. So let's go back to review. There's the robin range, right? Back and forth. This is why this bird is so unique and so cool and so rare. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the range of the Kirtland's warbler next to it. Look at that. So all that orange where it breeds and for the robin is all throughout Canada and Alaska. And if you look, there's just a couple places in Wisconsin, in the Upper Peninsula, just a few in Ontario, but mostly and primarily it's found in northern Michigan. Now, the blue way down to the bottom is the Bahamas, the, the, the Bahamian Islands. And so that's where it spends its winter. The yellow is its migration route. And so robins migrate a little bit, but locally. This bird goes all the way from Michigan, flies to the south in the in the fall, spends its summer, uh, winter in the Bahamas, then back in the spring, it starts to make its way all the way back to Michigan. That's a lot of flying, it's a long distance. So this is what happens. Here's another picture of a male. In the spring, it heads north, and this is gonna happen in about a month and a half. We're gonna start seeing them return at the beginning of May, they'll come back to, to Northern Michigan. And then they spend uh, their, their breeding season there in northern Michigan and Wisconsin, Ohio. And then in the fall, when there's no food, what does this bird eat? It eats insects, caterpillars. It'll even eat blueberries because blueberries grow in jack pine plantations. So if there's snow in jack pine, you're not going to find those insects. And so this bird says, hey, it's getting cold. Let's head back home for the winter. And then they come back down and they go to the Bahamas. Now, I'm gonna zoom in on the Bahami, bah, Bahamian Islands, excuse me. So these are all the islands. These birds are primarily found on the Harbor Islands right here, Cat Island, San Salvador Islands, and Long Island. Not all these other ones. And these are the primary research areas where scientists go down to see how the habitat is on those islands for the Kirtland's warbler to spend the winter. So it needs to eat during the summertime, needs to eat on its way down through the southern states. And then when it gets to the Bahamas, it needs to eat as well and find shelter. Now, if you've ever been to the Bahamas, you probably went to Nassau and that's the resort island. That's got nice beaches and everything. These other islands are, are they're inhabited by people, but they're not resort islands. They've got scr uh, shrubby 
uh, little plants with fruit on them, very rocky, uh, very vegetated. And so that's where the where this bird as, and other birds um, spend their, their winter time. So let's look closer at where they're found in their nesting range in northern Michigan. So this orange outlined area is roughly where they're found in, in northern Michigan. Now all of this is a pre-settlement vegetation map. And so all these little keys on the side over here, these colors indicate different forest types. And if you look at where all the beige, pretty much all the beige, maybe some down here too, but all this beige and tan indicates very poor sandy soils where jack pine trees like to grow. And that's why these birds are found here. They're not found up by Petoskey or by Traverse City <coughs> or over in Alpena. They're found the center part of the state where this, this scrubby jack pine grows. More specifically, this are, these are the management units that the DNR and the Fisheries and Wildlife Service and Forest Service use. So white indicates where the DNR manages these lands for the Kirtland's Warbler and the black outlined is where the uh, federal agencies manage for this bird. So wildfire is the key and that's why we call this the bird of fire. So let me explain how this works. Um, let me stop sharing here. Okay, so these are some jack pine trees growing and they're getting really, really tall. And jack pine has a general fire rotation of 50 years. So it means every 50 years, these trees get really prone to be catching on fire. Well, how do, how do they catch on fire? Well, it starts raining, lightning strike comes down and catches the ground on fire and catches the tree on fire catches this tree on fire and the ground's still burning and it catches this tree on fire. And there's this massive fire that keeps going down and it, it kills all of those trees. Now the birds can't survive fire, so they fly away and, and the animals run away because they don't like fire either. But this is good for jack pine because after that fire goes through, what do we have? We've got a bunch of trees that are just burnt sticks. Why is that good for this, this tree? Because this tree, I'm gonna go back to sharing here. This tree, here we go. And right there, this tree has cones that are called serotonous. That's how we pronounce it, serotonous. And I'll show you on my screen over here. These cones are covered with a waxy coating. And the only way that they open up like this one is open is by fire going over them. Now, when I was going to school to be a forester, <coughs> I thought, how can those cones catch fire and the seeds don't catch fire? That's because after the fire goes away, and the fire is still going this way. These trees are all dead. Fire is out. And there's a bunch of cones on the tree. And after the fire goes away, and we'll draw a big cone over here, it starts to open up. And the scales open up, that waxy coating goes away, and the seeds start to drop out. And there's millions of them all over that area. And within two weeks, and I'll do it in blue because it's a better color to see. In two weeks, it will look like your lawn. There will be hundreds of thousands of little jet pine trees, like a carpet of them. That's the only way this tree reproduces. We know that oaks reproduce by, a, by an acorn. A squirrel buries it. Next year, you'll have a, a, a little acorn seedling. Doesn't happen with jack pine. It needs that fire to open up those cones. So here is something else about pines, and these are native pines. We have the jack pine that has two needles. So does the red pine, but they're a little bit longer. And then we have the eastern white pine. And so in this program, you've learned two of our state symbols. The American robin is our state bird, and the eastern white pine is our state tree. Now, let me stop sharing again. I'm going to draw something else for you. The key element to 
the Kirtland's warbler and, and the association with jack pine is that jack pine, as it grows, and all pines for that matter, draw it real quickly, they have their branches down below the ground, way, way down to the ground. But every year that this tree grows one year older, it grows taller this way. And then one of these branches down here loses all its needles. We call that self pruning. And eventually a lot of the branch will go away and there may just be a little nub. But the key element, why is this important for the Kirtland's warbler is that these lower branches are down here. And remember I said that the robin nests above ground? Well, the Kirtland warbler doesn't. As odd as it may seem, the Kirtland warbler nests on the ground below these branches. And when these trees lose their lower branches, now what do you think is going to happen to that nest? So those lower branches are covering that, that nest from wind and rain and snow. We have snow may sometimes up here. Um, the heat of the day, because these places get really hot when they're not on fire. And also predators like opossum and raccoon and ravens and crows and blue jays will raid those nests. Fox, coyote. So once those trees get older and these branches start to come off, the Kirtland's warbler doesn't use that nest site anymore. It's not productive for them. So they moved to young jack pine. And so years ago, I'll share my screen again. If I can, there we go. So years ago, so there it is on the ground. Years ago, we had an issue where the population went way down back in the seventies. I'll share a graph in a second. Um, the population was just over 300 birds, basically 170 singing, singing males. And why was that? Well, because we stopped putting out, we stopped, we started putting out wildfires because people build their homes in jack pine forests up here. And that's not good for, for a homeowner to have their, their house burn. So we stopped the fires, which means we didn't have any young jack pine trees anymore. Secondly, there was another issue that we had which is this bird, it's called the brown-headed cowbird. And it's a good name because it's brown. Now it doesn't look like a cow, but it used to follow the bison. And what this bird does, let me, pl let me play the song for you. It's not nearly as pretty as the other two I played. Sounds like a squeaky wheel. Well, this bird does something called brood paratism which means the female lays the, her egg in a Kirtland's warbler nest or, not, or another bird's nest. And that bird gets bigger than the Kirtland's warbler as they're getting fed. And that baby opens its beak and says, feed me, feed me, feed me. It gets fed, it gets big. It knocks the other babies out of the nest with its wings. And then the female Kirtland's warbler raises the cowbird. Well, this was a big issue at that same time that we were going through this population decline. So there was a program uh, to capture the cowbirds and remove them from the nest areas. And that was pretty successful. And so now what we're seeing, instead of just, just um, a, a couple, uh, less than 100 birds, not less than 100, we, um, <clears throat> we now see that with these plantations that we that we put in, we hand plant them because we don't burn the fire, we don't burn the forests anymore. If it happens naturally, that's that's good for the for the habitat, but to be uh, more conscious of people that live nearby, we plant these trees. And because we've had all of these acres that we have, have now for the birds to, to live in and raise their young and the cowbird population went down, we now see an increase in the population of birds. You look all the way to 2015, of course, it's, it's past there, but this is the most recent graph that I could find. We're looking at over 5,000 birds now. So it is an excellent conservation uh, story where it was on the brink of extinction. Imagine how many, how little um, habitat was for this bird. Then what happened? 
was we planted trees, we got rid of the cowbirds, population increased, and now we just last year, I'm sorry, in 2019, it was taken off the endangered species list, which is a great story because most things that are on the endangered species list either stay on that list or they're removed because they're gone and they do become extinct. So it's not only Kirtland's warblers that benefit from the jack pine, um, people also benefit from this. So out of Hartwick Pines, we do the Kirtland's Warbler Tours. And we take people, and they come from all over the United States and all over the world just to see this little bird, okay? And so I've met people from all over Michigan. I've met people from Florida, from Oregon, from Texas, New Mexico, you name it. Uh, last two or two years ago, we had th people from 38 different states come to, come to see the Kirtland's Warbler. And also I've met people from all over the world, people from Japan and China, Austria, Germany, India, the UK, Turkey. Um, so I've, I've met a lot of people and they all come to see this bird. So why is, um, what's so special about this bird? Well, let me stop sharing for a second here. Birders are a unique group of individuals. So they spend thousands of dollars on binoculars and field guides. They come to Northern Michigan, they fill up their gas tanks, they eat at our restaurants, they stay in hotels or at the camps, campgrounds. They're spending money, so it, it brings some economy to this area. What are the, what's their goal? Their goal is to increase their life list. So if you're interested in birds, get yourself a journal, and then each entry you'll be remembered, you, you'll re remember where um, you saw something. So snowy egret, January 25th, 2017, Palo Verde National Park, Costa Rica, the Tempisk River, flocks of them flying along the shore, um, and just little notes about you can put on the birds that you see. So I've got a, probably about 150. I only started a couple years ago. When I go birding, I bring my birding bag. So I put this around my shoulder, and then what I always carry with me is a field guide and I bring the paper and pen so I can make notes because I don't want to bring that big journal with me. It's too, too heavy. My binoculars, of course. And then I usually bring some kind of um, liquid like water or, or um, I'll also bring um, some snacks, that sort of thing. And one thing for sure you want to bring if you're going to go look for the Kirtland's Warbler is bug spray because black flies like to live there and so do mosquitoes. But that's good because the Kirtland's Warbler eats those things. All right, a few more left here. And then I'll open it up for questions. Okay. So besides the humans that find pleasure in looking at this bird, we also have many different species of animals and plants and insects and birds that are found there. Now, when the tour, the tours that I've done, I've seen bear tracks and scat. I've seen badger tracks and scat, fox, coyote, deer, turkey, um, reptiles, like some snakes that will be found in those areas as well. The one I wanna focus on though, <coughs> well, actually two, real quickly, the Nashville warbler in the bottom left, very handsome bird as well. It also nests on the ground and so, it will use these, these jack pine plantations until they're old enough when they drop their lower branches and the Nashville Warbler kind of follows the Kirtland's Warbler and says, well, where's, where's some good nesting sites? So they kind of work together to, to survive. But I want to focus on the Allegheny Mound Ant. Now here in Northern Michigan, a lot of the, the local community would just call them fire ants, but they're not fire ants. Those are found elsewhere, but these do bite and they hurt, they'll leave a nice welt on your leg. So I like to wear jeans when I go out there instead of shorts, because if you step on one of these small little ant mounds, you'll know it real quickly as um, dozens of these things will crawl up your shoe and up your sock and onto your leg and bite you. So let me show you what the mound looks like. These are the mounds that these ants make. Now these insects have a, a distinct relationship with jack pine ecosystems because this mound can be about a foot above the ground and it's teeming with all these ants and if you go up and put a stick near it 
they have this sensory that they they communicate with each other and they come and attack that stick. It's really interesting to watch. I don't like to disturb them too much because they're doing their own thing. But below ground, this nest of tunnels and catacombs, it's like a labyrinth, can go three to five feet below ground. So when the fires come through these areas, as they do, these ants know that they find safety at the bottom of that ant mound and they wait till the fire's gone. And when the fire's gone, they come back up and they look for half charred insects and things to eat, take it back down to their larvae and their babies and they eat. Um, so these ants like this fire ecosystem as well. So last slide here, destroyed. And I hear this all the time on TV. Um, out West, there were 20 million acres destroyed. Well, we know now in Jack Pine speak that they're not destroyed. This is the way these plants, these trees reproduce. If there's no fire, we don't have new Jack Pine. That's why we have to plant them now instead. So we'll take those cones, put them in, an, in, a, in a heated area like an oven. The cones will open up. We take the seeds out, put them in some soil, and, a, and we start growing little baby seedlings. And we eventually pull those out and bundle them up and ship them out to an area and hand plant all of those jack pines, okay? So um, why is it important that we save this bird? What, what is the purpose? Right? Maybe if you have, a, if you have a, an idea, you can put that in the chat. But why is it important? Well, there's several reasons. One, it maintains biodiversity. So this bird adds to the fact that the Nashville warblers are there, the blue jays are there, the indigo buntings are there, the eastern towhees are there, the, the, um, the chipping sparrow and the vesper sparrows and the grasshopper sparrows, all of those birds are there. They like they love li like living there and the mammals and the insects. So it's an increase in biodiversity. Secondly, we don't know if this bird was removed from that that food chain or that network, what would happen? Would it collapse? Every several years, Jack Pine, there's a, in a Jack Pine plantation, there's an outbreak of what's called Jack Pine budworm. It's a little caterpillar turns into a moth. The Kirtland's warbler love feasting on those. And so if we didn't get rid of those, would the trees then be more susceptible to jack pine budworm and die from that without catching on fire, without producing cones and seeds? So there's a connection there that we don't know and we don't wanna break. Um, it's very important to keep them around. And third, maybe there's a value of this bird that we haven't discovered yet. There's a lot of scientists Ornithologists, wildlife biologists, foresters, they're doing research on the Kirtland's warbler. How, how to plant the trees, how many per acre do we plant? Um, how, many, how, how many acres should we plant? Should we only plant 25 or 2,000? And so research is constantly going on to find more about this Kirtland's warbler. And now if, um, if, you, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. Natalie, is there anything in the chat? Well, Craig, that was super fun. I learned a lot of things. I didn't know about budworms and all those. Uh, right. two, two questions for you. Okay. The first one is uh, how much space does a mating pair need? Like what's their territory and their mm -hmm. range? Oh, good question. So um, one male prefers to have about 20 acres of their, of, of their home range. Now, <clears throat> keep in mind these birds do not, let's say that this is the nest. And so this is the this is 20 acres. So the bird will make sure that, and it flies from area to area, uh, landing on trees, singing that song, saying, this is my area. But let's say there is a two track going through this area. And this is all forest. And this is all forest. Well, that's why when we do these tours, we'll see that bird fly across the two track because it's going in a big circle. It goes back and forth too. Now, another bird can have territory that's right here. And there's their nest. So this male will come here and sing and this bird will go, wait a minute, that's my area. And you see them fight and fly after each other. It's pretty, uh, pretty fun to watch them, how they, how they really uh, interact with their territories. I love it and I love that you draw for us. Uh, <laughs> second one, how did the Kirtland's Warbler get its name? 
Very good question. Um, so it's named after Dr. Jared Kirtland, who is a, a native of Ohio. He was an ornithologist and um, um, a wildlife biologist. And keep in mind that this is kind of a unnerving story, but this is the truth. So way back in 1800s, and even before that, people who were studying birds, the way that they did that is they'd go out and they'd see a bird and go, I wonder what that is. And they'd take their shotgun and they'd shoot it. They'd go grab that bird, take it back to their office, look up their literature and materials and communicate with their friends. Like, I got this bird, it's got a red throat, but black wings and and they would try to determine what it was. They needed a male and they needed a female. And they also liked to get a nest with eggs. So they would have all of these collections of these birds in their, in their offices. So one day, there's a young man named Mr. Pease, P-E-A-S-E. -E. He was in Cleveland bird hunting and he sees this yellow chested bird fly over. He's like, I wonder what that is. And he shoots it grabs it, and he goes to talk to his father-in-law, Dr. Jared Kirtland, and he's like, hey, dad, what kind of bird is this? And his, Mr. Kurt, Dr. Kirtland's like, well, I don't know what kind of bird this is. Let me send it to a friend of mine who's doing research on warblers. And so he sends it to his friend. I forgot that guy's name, but that, that doctor was like, well, Jared, that's a nice find. I've never seen anything before. Let's, um, we should give it a name. And Jared, Dr. Kirtland's like, sure, call it whatever you want. He's like, well, let's call it the Kirtland's Warbler. So it became the Kirtland's Warbler when it could have, should have been Pease's Warbler because Pease is the one, Charles Pease is the one that shot it. Then come to find out once there was this huge ornithological uh, paper written about this new bird, new bird species discovered, it gets into the hands of this guy who is doing research on birds in the Bahamas. And he's reading the article, and the way the story goes, he's reading the article going, oh, Kirtland's Warbler, this is what the markings are. And he opens up his drawer, and he's got one in his drawer. And he had found it five years, maybe 10 years before Kurt, Mr. Pease shot it. So it could have been that guy's last name instead of Kirtland's, but ended up being Kirtland's Warbler instead. I love this, and this is what we'll, we will end on because... I want to find a new species that gets named after us. That would be perfect. The Elkins butterfly. I need it. <laughs>